speech, a prolific dissertation. If I was a speaker, I would use my hands. If I was a potter, ooh, no matter who or what we are, we must praise. Let the people love God. Bless Him. Let it ring with love and truth. With our gifts, we exalt Thee. God, we must praise. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jocelyn. Let's give her a round, another round of applause. <laughs> so the, the the guys uh, from AV, uh, they started the live stream a little late, so can we rewind everything that we just did? No, I'm joking. <laughs> but no, <laughs> they did start the live stream late, but thank you guys for starting it anyway. Uh, so we're live now. Uh, Jocelyn, she was, uh, you were on the live, right? She was on there, right? She, you guys got her on the live stream? <laughs> yeah, all right, good, thank you. <laughs> all right, so uh, now we'll introduce our hosts. Um, we have Ms. Elnor Reese, uh, Vice President of uh, Global Communications of Whirlpool Corporation. Uh, Elnor Reese serves as Vice President of uh, Global Communications for Whirlpool Corporation, a leading global uh, major appliance company. Reese is responsible for guiding Whirlpool's global communications functions and corporate communication strategy to support the company's vision and improving life at home. Uh, in this role, uh, Reese leads and a great team across communications to align with diverse portfolios of work against critical uh, business objectives. Reese joined Whirlpool in 2019 as Senior Director of Global Communications. Her, her work has since included advancing the company's initiatives for customers, employees, and communities. While coordinating corporate global communications campaigns and programs, prior to Whirlpool, Reese served as Director of International Government Relations for General Motors, uh, supporting the company's approach to address global policy and government affairs impacting the company. Reese uh, also served as a principal advisor for a consulting firm and public strategies, where she provided strategic crisis and public affairs counsel to corporate clients. She was also uh, formerly with CNN as a news producer and writer for CNN International and uh, as an editorial, producing editorial content for a number, a number of global news programs. Reese currently serves on the board of the uh, Bent Harbor of the Greater Southwest Michigan Boys and Girls Club. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree uh, in international affairs from Glo the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, let's all give it up for Miss Anora Reese. Thank you, Nick. Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming out. What a beautiful day. It's gorgeous. I can't believe it's March and it feels like this, so happy for that. Uh, what a great start to an amazing event, Nick. Uh, great job so far, and I think, I mean, you all are just in for a treat today. Um, such amazing women who will be on a panel and then some really fabulous presenters. So I am just humbled and honored to be a part of this event and thank you to Andrews University as well for hosting us. So let's get right to it. Uh, our first presenter I have the pleasure of introducing. It is, uh, she is Miss Ronika J. Williams, hailing from the best small town in Michigan, Benton Harbor, <laughs> is a passionate curator of black culture. Since a young age, her fascination with history nail polish and obituaries has driven her storytelling journey. Wow. When not immersed in narratives, uh, Ronika explores new areas in search of the perfect taco. 
Yes, you, I said that right, Taco. A lover of love and a connoisseur of laughter over card games, definitely not spades. She's gearing up for her feature documentary, Journey of Many Souls, a continuation of her research at North Carolina Central University. Her current installation is her digital project and upcoming exhibit, Retracing Their Steps. So watch out, y'all, for her captivating captivating work. Uh, Ronika, I will give the mic to you. Thank you. All right, I'm just gonna go along with what's on the screen. I was gonna try to pull it up on my, oh, now it's working, okay. All right, so my name is, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ronika Williams, and I'm gonna give you a, pre, a brief overview of what I do before I dive right into story time. Is that okay with everyone? Everyone likes a little story time, right? Okay. Where am I pointing? Okay, okay, hey, hey, so good. Where am I pointing to, to change it? Just at the screen, okay. Oh, it's over. Am I doing the right thing? Oh, over here. Okay, so I just wanna give a brief introduction. My name is Ronika Williams. I'm the founder of the Story Salon, but some people may know me also as the ancestral archivist. Oh, for over 10 years, I've had archival and research and digitiza digitization um, experience. But more than anything, I've launched multiple brands and projects that all fall under the umbrella of storytelling, which is the Final 48 Project, Please Do Tell Podcast, and my own blog of Still Lens, and a children's book, which is Adventures of Alley Cats, which we are now putting all under the umbrella of the Story Salon. So, does anyone remember their first, their very first job? I should see a lot, okay, all right. So my very first job was reading obituaries to my grandfather every evening. That's how I got my money to go down to the corner store to get my chips and my juice and everything. And that's how I also fell in love with storytelling. So I would sit on the porch a lot of afternoons and evenings with my grandfather, who was the Justice of the Peace in Benton Township, John Williams, and my grandmother would usually be in the window, but we would share a lot of stories revolving what was it like growing up in the South, or what was it like even knowing everybody. I felt like every time we went to the, to the grocery store, my grandfather knew someone, which was also very hard to go to the grocery store with him because he knew everyone. So it started at home. I started asking these questions of why is there, why don't I see enough representation of myself on TV and in the textbooks? So my, my first history book that I received was basically famous black Americans from A to Z. And I want you all to focus really closely on that black address book because that's going to come up later in the story. So I was a college student, it was undergrad, and one of the assignments was doing a family tree, which got a little rough because I didn't know much beyond my grandparents of where they came from. So I sat in this drive-through and I called my dad and I said, can you tell me about Granny's, which is his mother, can you tell me about her people? He said, all I know is that there was a name change that no one talks about. I said, okay, so I said, you pretty much I'm gonna flunk this assignment. He said, well, I don't think you're gonna flunk it. Your, your tree just won't be as, as, as large as everyone else's. <laughs> so years after that conversation, I found myself um, in the living room with my, with my father. Um, a, a day before we were in this, before I took this picture, I found out that my father had stage four prostate cancer and that he was now having kidney failure. 
I began to ask him more questions about our family history, how much did he remember, and he didn't know much at all. He said, I'm just gonna give you as much as I have, which wasn't much. So I sat by his bedside on February 13th, 2013, and I said, I'm gonna give you three promises. And then that was it. That those three promises were to start a children's book and to, to write a children's book and dedicate that first one to him, to start doing documentaries. But I said, you know what? I, I think I'm going to just go back to grad school, and I'm going to graduate with high honors. So you just don't worry about me. Four hours later, he had took his last breath. So I started doing the work. My first step was going to grief counseling. No one in my family had ever gone to grief counseling, so this was a little taboo for a lot of us. So I found myself in that bathroom before going into that group grief counseling session, and I looked around that room, and I saw no one that looked like me and my sister. So I told her, from then on, I'm going to start collecting stories of the black grieving story. So I wrote, the plan, I wrote the plan and made it very plain. So this is actually me going back to grad school. So I left Michigan in February of 2013, and I traveled back down to North Carolina with hopes of re-enrolling in school by the fall, and I did just that. And I did graduate with high honors, magna cum laude, from North Carolina Central University. And my research was on finding the missing links of African-American stories in Richmond, Virginia during the Confederacy. Can you imagine this little black girl was in Richmond collecting all those stories about black folks in Richmond, Virginia? Which won a, a, a place in a national competition, might I add? Okay. <laughs> So I began starting doing the Final 48 Project, which was the journey of grief in the black community, because I wanted to be able to help those that look like me to be able to process their grief. But I had to process my own. So I started going through my dad's things. I finally got to a place two years after his passing. I decided to sit down and go through all of his boxes. And my dad was quite a storyteller, so I really didn't believe a lot of the things that he said, because it was always a really good joke wrapped up in there. But this one is actually proof that he actually flew in. So the airport that's in Ben Harbor, they were actually flying into Ben Harbor back in the day. So this is proof that this actually happened. So when he got discharged from the military, he actually um, flew into to the Ben Harbor Airport and walked to his home at 1070 East Main Street in Benton Harbor. Oh, what's happening? Okay, there we go. All right, so as I'm going through his archives, this is actually one of his um, pension statements from Bosch Breaking System, and I noticed that there's a picture of me and him in his wrapped up in certain envelopes. So I began to start to, okay, my father's archival, archival practices are very different from my own. I have to literally go through everything. And I found this picture of my grandmother, my Uncle Curtis, my dad down at the bottom, and my Aunt Betty. And I said, my God, I want to know my grandmother's story. Where did she come from? Since my dad couldn't give me a whole lot. So that black address book that was at the very beginning of the presentation, I went through there and I said, my dad gave me a name when I was in that, in that drive through many years ago in undergrad, and I said, okay, he gave me the last name of Steele. Maybe there's a name in this address book that he left behind, and it was. So I Googled that address. I sent someone a Facebook message that actually was attached to this address, and I said, let's just see what happens. Ooh, so eight months later, I get a response, and he says, the gentleman says, give me a call tomorrow afternoon. We have a lot to talk about. And it took him eight months to respond because he said, I didn't know if you were real or not. So I started, so I started sending him obituaries that my mom kept in the drawer of every family member of my grandmother that had passed. He said, okay, now I know that you're legit. Call me and I'll tell you everything you want to know. So seven months after meeting him, I logged on to Facebook and I see that his father had now passed. Another person, another person who could give me another story 
to unlock more branches of my tree. So my mother told me, you know what? You need to take that ride down to Birmingham, Alabama and meet this family that you never knew existed. So this is our first embrace. This was outside of the church in Birmingham, Alabama. I am meeting my cousin Kelvin for the very first time. And Kelvin is the one who is attached to that address that you saw in that address book. So after that, I felt the charge to let me just talk to every family member that I know that is still alive and maybe has some connections to my grandmother. So I actually, my sister and I flew out to California in 19, well, the last time I saw my Aunt Jessie was 1996, and this was actually taken in 2017, shortly after her 90th birthday. And I began asking her all these beautiful, I, want, I wanted to know all the beautiful stories that she had about my grandmother. And she said, shortly after our mother died, your grandmother took us in from Arkansas to Michigan, and that is our great migration story. So we traveled all across California, just trying to get as much as we could as far as family members, because a part of their great migration story was traveling from the South to California as well. And then it happened. In January of 2020, I went back to visit that same cousin Kelvin in Birmingham, Alabama, and I said, can we please go to the address that was in that address book? And now I can say that I have stepped foot on steel land. So then I went back to school again and got another master's degree, the, actually the master's degree that my dad saw me start. So soon after that, I decided to really turn my thesis project into what we call now is retracing their steps. So the journey of many souls was birth, investigating multiple narratives of the great, migra great migration through the lens of the Steele family legacy from 1910 to 2020. And this is where it all begins. I took a trip, I took a road trip down to Montgomery, Alabama, and I knew that I wanted to tell my family's legacy story. So I went back to the place where this name change had possibly hap happened. So I stepped foot on the land of Thomaston, Alabama. The next place I went, I took the death certificate of my grandmother's mother, and I went down to Dermot, Arkansas. And this is actually the land where my great-grandmother, my great-grandfather, and my grandmother's siblings are buried. And just this past Sunday, I made it to the high school where my grandmother graduated from. So if we think about my grandmother actually grew up in Tiller, Arkansas, and to, ha to be ed educated the way that she wanted to and to be the first to graduate in her family, she took a 90-minute trip and lived with her sister in Bay Strip, Louisiana. So what does this look like moving forward for the, the stories that I'm telling? I want to be able to have a an exhibit. I started my first exhibit at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and that was telling the stories of the black families at Historic Stagville, which is the largest plantation in North Carolina. So then I started, I said, you know what, I can probably do this for my own family and for so many other families that look just like me. So that's why I birthed retracing their steps. So hopefully our future will look like this, me and my good girlfriends at the exhibits taking pictures and talking about family history. So you see that nice little QR code? If you have a, a smartphone, that's, that's where you can scan and kind of keep up with the project that we have going on. And really keep up with me and see where my travels are because it hasn't stopped. Retracing their steps is still ongoing. And I thank you so much. I am Ronika Williams, also known as the Ancestral Archivist, and I hope to see you soon at the Story Salon. Thank you. give Ms. Ronika another yeah. round of applause. Thank you very much. All right. So now,
We have a local business here. Uh, tell us, Dr. Soto. Hi, I'm Denise Santos. I'm the owner of the Lilac Loft. We sell candles and gifts, and we do uh, candle-making workshops. And we have a free candle to give away tonight. It's a rose uh, spa-scented candle for those of you who entered our drawing. Sorry about that. So do you want to do the honors? You're going to have to dig deep in here. Drum roll, please. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. We got one. Sharon. Shannon. Shannon. Ch yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. Hey. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We're going to package it up for you if you want to pick it up at our table. Congratulations. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And uh, we're back to our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> That's fun. Wow. Prizes and everything. Awesome, Nick. Okay, um, amazing, incredible work, Veronica. Thank you for sharing uh, your, your amazing work. Um, and now on to another fantastic presenter. Uh, coming up now is uh, Kina King. Kina King was born in Benton Harbor as well as a graduate of Siena Heights University. She obtained her bachelor's degree in community service with a concentration in family systems. Ms. King has dedicated her career to educating and empowering families while supporting the building of a resilient community. Kina volunteered as an AmeriCorps member with the Benton Harbor Boys and Girls Club, and after two years, she became program coordinator and served in that capacity for eight years. Kina transitioned to the Berrien County Health Department managing family health programs, overseeing impactful programs like the Nurse Family Partnership, Taking Pride in Prevention, Michigan Adolescent and Pregnancy Program, and the Triple P Positive Program. Currently, Ms. King serves as Senior Project Specialist at Corwell Health in the Population Health Department, focusing on maternal and child health initiatives. Be beyond her professional roles, Kina is a dedicated community leader, serving on advisory boards, coalitions, and civic groups, including the Strong Women of Faith Breast Cancer Support Group, Charm Civic Organization, and the Great Start Collaborative Executive Board. Whew. I'm tired just saying that. <laughs> In addition to her various roles, Kina is the owner and operator of K. Riley Enterprise and co-owner of KB Ventures LLC, emphasizing her passion for assisting families with securing housing. While Ms. King wears many important hats, mother of five young children, adult children, uh, whom she adores is her greatest title, and her other greatest title is that of a believer in Christ and Nana of three amazing boys. Kina often shares her, it's always too soon to quit mindset, derived from her, her parents, Odell Riley and Kate King Riley, who taught and modeled a life filled with perseverance and determination. Everyone, please welcome Miss Kina King. Good evening, good evening. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Kena King and it is truly an honor to be here and a privilege to stand before you tonight. At this wonderful empowerment event titled Speaking Up with Women. Serving the purpose of empowering the lives of women. I'm moving from the mic. So. so as we gather here to celebrate the strength, resilience, and achievements of women, I am reminded of the power that lies within each and every one of us. Speaking up with women expresses a need to share, uplift, liberate, and motivate each other. My glasses is doing a thing. I need them to read, but not yet. 
<laughs> so however, it is important that we acknowledge the need for us to take care of ourselves first. Self-care is the first step. This will ensure we are able to show up as our best selves, being intentional with self first, then sharing with others. As women, we have not always operated in a space with seeing and being understood. Opportunities like this special event can serve as a reminder of the importance of unity and the willingness to celebrate each other. Being able to celebrate other women, even when you're struggling yourself, is an act of solidarity, kindness, and maturity. It contributes to a culture of support, encouragement, and positivity. Speaking up with women and for women has not always been an easy task due to hardships, obstacles, adversity, and challenges we have faced. Society has also helped to shape our beliefs, both positive and negative, by painting this cookie cutter perspective about the life of women. Dismissing the many obstacles that we have faced on our journey, not to mention us being marginalized time and time again. So, I didn't take the traditional route. High school, graduation, college, marriage, and family. Some people will say that I took the long way around. I struggled for many years with a substance use disorder. And my life had many ups and downs. It started when I was in my senior year of high school and went well into my adult life. For a long time, I struggled with the ability to share openly with people what I once struggled with. But today, I utilize what I struggle with as an opportunity to help encourage others and motivate others. I did a lot of beating myself up, and others helped throw a couple punches along the way, too. But I didn't give up. I stayed in the race. I worked two jobs sometimes, started going to college, taking one class at a time sometimes, taking two classes at a time, and then there was moments on my journey that I was able to take a full caseload. Eventually, I graduated, receiving my associate's degree, and I continued my education journey while also working and still being a mom. I received my bachelor's degree, and I'm currently working on my master's degree. I don't count clean time because that's not what, that isn't important. It's showing up every day. Although I have many years of clean time, that is not what is important about the journey. It's about being able to share, encourage, and inspire others along the way that did not have some of the same support, encouragement, and the belief within themselves that they can make it. Sometimes we believe that we are the only ones that is experiencing hardships. Being a mother, student, sister, daughter, professional can come with challenges that make us feel not seen or heard. But I come to tell you, if you woke up today, you're not done. Your life has purpose. Invest in yourself. It starts with believing in you. Take your gifts, dreams, and talents and make them a reality. 
and then support others along the way. That doesn't mean you won't stumble. That doesn't mean you are going to feel as if everything is perfect. That doesn't mean you won't become frustrated. What it means is, if you are still here, keep going. Life is a journey filled with many chapters consisting of highs, lows, middle grounds, the messy middle, the perfect storm, but keep pushing. <laughs> Respecting the journey and the process, continuously working to craft your gifts and talents. That might mean studying more, exercising, praying, for me, eating less cookies, <laughs> and reading, and praying, and fasting, and sharing, and volunteering, and sharing my story, and encouraging other women. Women, this is our season. This is our season. Figure out who you are, whose you are, and step up. How long are we going to wait? Don't worry about what anyone else is saying or doing. Draw your line in the sand and stand on it. Bet on you. Take your ideas and insert them into your passion and make that thing a reality. Always stay aware of self, continuously looking for ways to improve and grow. Rather, that's more reading, again, singing, running, doing those things that will help you go to the next level. Our stories are loaded. Everything we experience, the tears, the laughter, the joy and pain are the things that has catapulted us into greatness. Move from being stuck, you are the woman for the job. Be encouraged, there are better days ahead if you don't give up. You might not have your parents, you might not have the car you want, you might not have the house you want, you might not have the job you want, or the husband, Lord. <laughs> Keep pushing, it's always too soon to quit. I give anybody single, I got, I got my number, okay. Okay, always too soon to quit. It has been so many women that has gone before us, paving the way. So when it feels like we are facing insurmountable obstacles, that's when we dig deep and we know we are destined for greatness. You don't have to have all the pieces. We don't have to have all the pieces to the puzzle together. Get up, move, start connecting whatever pieces you have, knowing that you are already a masterpiece, building one piece at a time. As I conclude today, I urge each and every one of us to remember the power we hold within ourselves and the potential we have to create positive change. Let us continue to celebrate, uplift, and empower the, the women around us, not just today, but every day. Together we can break barriers, shadow stereotypes, and pave the way for more inclusive, equal, and empowered future for all women. Thank you for being a part of this journey, and may we always speak up with courage, stand with strength, and empower each other with unwavering solidarity. Remember, our voices, our power, our actions are impactful, and our unity is unstoppable. Let's rise up together, for when women support women, incredible things happen. Thank you. Ms. King for that phenomenal message. Um, we still have a lot, we have vendors here as well. Uh, they're doing a great job over there, uh, you know, with the giveaways. We also have Honor Credit Union. Uh, they have their 
uh, $250 prom promotion. You start a check-ins account. So some of the students, if you don't have a check-ins account, you can go see on the credit union over there, get you one of these cards, and you'll get, get you all set in a free $250 there. Uh, again, I'd like to thank all of everyone who came out to help us here today. Uh, we had many uh, donations come in. Uh, I started fundraising like two, three weeks before, <laughs> before this, and we raised a, a good amount of money to put this on. So uh, let's thank some of our sponsors, uh, you know, that were able to help out. So Zix Meats uh, is located here in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Uh, they do a phenomenal job. Let's clap for Zix. Uh, Zix Meats. Um, uh, we also have Coastline Realty, uh, a real, uh, realty company here also in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Uh, Stark's Family Funeral Home. Um, yeah. uh, Whiteford Wealth Management. Uh, and Barion Ford. <laughs> yep. Yep. And also, thank you to all the anonymous donors that uh, helped out as well. Uh, uh, and we all, yeah, again, our, our vendors, uh, Kingdom Business Consulting, they have a giveaway that they'll be giving away. So see them at the end uh, for more information about that giveaway. Uh, we have uh, Primerica, uh, uh, we have C. Sherrod's Designs. Uh, as well with Courtney Sherrod, uh, and we have many more vendors. So please make sure you guys uh, give them a visit. Thank you. Uh, now we'll have the Ones Dance Group. It's an award-winning, great dance group located in Benton Harbor, uh, their Benton Harbor area, uh, joining us. Some of them weren't able to join us tonight because the basketball teams are so good, and they're cheerle <laughs> the cheerleaders, they got to they gotta be there. You know, you got a job to do. So um, the ones, uh, thank you. Without further, no further ado.
on, 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 on. All right. Wow. Amazing. Amazing ladies. Let's hear it again for uh, DeWans. <laughs> talented, talented ladies. All right. Well, you know, the night keeps getting better and better. We're about to have another actually speaking panel. Uh, so if the panel could come up to the front of the room, please. That's right. Thank you. Okay. All right. And as they uh, take their seat, I have the esteemed honor of introducing our panel facilitator, Ms. Debbie Michelle. Uh, Debbie Michelle is the Director of Communication and Editor of the Lake Union Herald. She received her Master's of Science degree from Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, New York, New York in 1994, and her Bachelor of Science degree in New York and uh, in TV and radio. Journalism concentration as well from Brooklyn College at City University in 1991. Uh, Ms. Debbie Michelle also began her professional career, career in 1990 as a media buyer, then became an associate literary agent in 1992. Then in 1995, she became a news associate for Dateline NBC and Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, New York, New York. In 1996, she became the associate producer and producer for Dateline NBC, where she produced news segments and documentaries for clients such as the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and Good Housekeeping Magazine, produced MSNBC headliners and Legends documentaries, booked high-profile newsmakers for exclusive interviews, Field produced breaking news stories and shot digital video. Through her association with Jean Michael, a Seventh Day Adventist videographer, she became a member of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. In 2008, Debbie joined the faculty of Andrews University as associate professor of communication, where she taught journalism and communication, assisted with the development of new curriculum, served as an advisor to journalism students, and developed Envision, a student created and produced magazine of which Debbie was the editor in chief. Debbie and Jean have one daughter, Christiana, and please give a round of applause for Miss Debbie Michelle. Hello. Let me just get this chair in position where I can see the faces. But thank you so much for that. And thank you so much to Nicholas Gunn. I am just, <laughs> I am just amazed that it is a young man who's planning a program for women. I'm honored. I really am honored. So thank you, thank you, Nick. And thank you, Eleanor, for that kind introduction. And so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to these women. I've been talking with them backstage and I'm just blown away. And I know it's going to be an interesting conversation that we're going to be having with these six illustrious ladies. We have a cultural anthropologist and Andrews University professor. We have a judge. We have a township supervisor. We have a community affairs professional. We have a mayor. We have a school board president. Their backgrounds are amazing. And for some of them, which you'll soon learn, that's just a part of the job that they have. They wear multiple hats. And so it just makes it for me all the more for us to recognize these women. And so if you can just put your hands together again for our panelists. All right, so without any further ado, I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about what they do today, and a quick summary of how they ended up in the roles that they are playing or that they're doing today. All right, so we will start with Professor. It is such a delight to be here. I'm Stacy Hatfield. I'm a cultural anthropologist here at Andrews University. I study intersections of race and gender in the United States. I did my dissertation research in Birmingham, Alabama. 
such an incredible and amazing place to be. Um, I was a nurse for a long time. I'm a second career academic. I was in the ER for a long time. And when I found anthropology, I didn't find it until I was in my 30s. I am late to, late to the field. But when I found anthropology, I was just like, oh, this is it. Between the word and anthropology, I, I get it. I understand what's happening here. I understand what it is to be a woman in the church. I understand what it is to be a woman and a nurse in the hospital. I am really understanding much more about the, the kinds of things that shape those dynamics. Um, and so I am only have been at Andrews here for about three years. And it has just really been an honor and a pleasure. And I am really delighted to be here today. My name is uh, my name is Mabel Johnson Mayfield. Um, I am the chief judge for Berrien County. Thank you to all of you who voted. Um, and how to keep that short? There is no. It's been a journey, and that's uh, some things we we talked about. There's. I don't even know how to keep it short. Um, I've been in Berrien County for almost 44 years now, and um, I have shared at some other spaces, uh, this is the place where I grew up. Okay, you understand that? People say, where did you grow up? I was born in a town called Eldorado, Arkansas, and um, my parents, my father a pastor, my mother a school educator, uh, we moved to Gary, Indiana, Yes, right around the corner from the Jackson 5 uh, when I was five years old. Those are all the questions I always get, so I thought we'd just throw it out there. Um, when I was five years old, and all of my um, elementary and all of that school training, I'm a um, graduate of uh, Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana, and attended law school in Valparaiso, Indiana, where I met the love of my life for almost 44 years now, my husband, um, attorney John Mayfield, and it is because of him that I followed him here <laughs> and didn't have a clue why. Uh, God is providential in all that he does and he makes no mistakes. And so this is where I was supposed to be. This is where I grew up. And I told them in the back, uh, my car, I park in the same lot that I parked in for 44 years now. You wonder, about well, what did you do? What kind of progress? So I started at Berrien County Legal Services, which is a little red brick building uh, right next to the Sheriff's Department. Uh, my office now, I look out over and I can see uh, the Sheriff's Department uh, <laughs> and beyond that. But the um, little parking space, I started then from there, Legal Services, over to the court in 1992. Uh, after about 10 years stint with them. And um, yes, I was the first African-American uh, jurist, period, who ever sat on a bench in Berrien County. <laughs> and I served there for seven years. Um, and um, you're going to ask me, we'll get to that part, sort of how the why. But um, I was also, during that period, the first African-American president of the Berrien County Bar Association, and um, then was um, uh, appointed by uh, Governor John Engler in 2000 and have retained that seat as a probate judge currently. And in 2020, who knew COVID was coming? Um, I became the chief judge uh, for Berrien County. So again, thank you all for the support you have. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Yates, and I started with the state of Michigan as a caseworker, helping families who couldn't help themselves at the time. I transformed myself to uh, bigger positions within the state, and I ended up working zone-wide, which uh, got my name as the reduction lady. I learned how to save money, and that seemed to catch on, so many people sent for me to come to their counties to teach them how I did it. After retiring from the state of Michigan, I got a call from Benton Harbor Area Schools, and I started teaching within a week. They were short on teachers. So I taught there for about four and a half years and uh, got a job with a company traveling, uh, a private company. And my son uh, had a little boy, and they were having daycare issues. So as a grandmother, I came home, and I stayed with him until he entered school, after which 
uh, I was reading the newspaper where Benton Charter Township was looking for a supervisor. So the first run, I was 33 votes short. So uh, some friends and I uh, decided that that was wonderful for a first run. I should try it again. So I went back as a trustee and I won that position. And I stayed there until a, the supervisor's position became open and I was appointed in 2019, which, and then I was elected in 2020 in the position I hold today. <laughs> and I am running for re-election this year. So I look forward to helping many more people. I like doing things differently. I like helping people who need the help, especially our seniors. Good evening, and I'm Mona Livingston. I'm the External Affairs Manager for Indiana, Michigan Power and AEP Company. And it's just a fancy title. Basically, I'm a liaison between the company and the community. If you were to describe my job, I'm a translator. I translate technical engineering work to uh, common terms where people like me and you can understand what it is that the engineers are trying to say and why they need to get this work done and why we need to cut the tree before April 1st, before bat season starts, <laughs> because we have to protect the bats. So that's what I do. I think my superpower is problem solving because I do that all day, every day. And how I got here, well, the accent that you hear is from India. I was born in India. I lived half my life there. I got my degree in business from India. Uh, started my career very young, actually at five, uh, with my dad in, his, uh, uh, family, in the family business, so didn't get paid, so I don't know if it actually counts. Um, but then um, uh, got my, uh, I'm a gemologist, worked in the jewelry field, um, also worked in banking, moved to education for over a decade, worked in nonprofits, and now I'm in this role. And it's not just a job change, these are like careers, but I wouldn't do it in any other way. Each of these uh, phases has uh, built resiliency, given me skill sets, and added a facet to my character, um, and just who I am today. So, and I'm so thankful for this opportunity of sharing my journey with you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brooke Thomas. Um, in my uh, regular job, I'm a social worker. I work for the Children's Advocacy Center of Southwest Michigan. In my free time, I'm the mayor of St. Joe. Um, <laughs> it's a very part-time job, but you know, it's, somebody's got to do it, so here I am. Um, yeah, I'm very fortunate to be able to be a social worker and in the political life because both are so very important to me. Um, I was elected to the city commission in 2021. I served two years there and then just this past November I was appointed to mayor and it has been a whirlwind of fun and meeting people and learning new things every single day. I see a lot of familiar faces in here so thank you for everyone coming to support this wonderful women's event. Um, it's actually been a pleasure meeting everyone on this panel too. We had quite a bit of time backstage just chatting and getting to know everyone. I have a lot in common with Miss Yates. We are social workers and politicians at the same time. So, and yes, absolutely. So it's great that everyone is here. Um, other than that, I have a lot of other community involvement. I'm the board chair of the Out Center of Southwest Michigan. I have just under a week left. I'm gonna retire from that position just because mayor does take up quite a bit of time. But um, I look forward to seeing everyone in the community moving forward. Thanks for having us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Deshauna Robinson. I am the president of the Board of Education for Benton Harbor Area Schools. I also serve as the assistant deputy director for the Benton Harbor Housing Commission, which is Benton Harbor's biggest landlord. Um, my journey to these roles is one that's unbelievable. I went to school to be a teacher. It was in my fourth year in my pre-internship that I realized that that was not my calling. 
I almost gave my mother a heart attack because I was supposed to be on my way out of the door. I had to uh, think tangibly about what it was that I wanted to do with my life. And so I did graduate with a uh, Bachelor of Arts. I have an English degree and a communication minor. I looked at everything that I was doing to earn a living in college and realized that social work was my passion. So I then enrolled in the Masters of Social Work program for Western Michigan University. I've done quite a bit in that field. I've worked in a shelter for youth in crisis. I've worked in a juvenile center as an assistant supervisor. I've run a domestic violence shelter in Kalamazoo, if anyone's familiar with the YWCA of Kalamazoo. I worked for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Similar to Kathy, I began as a caseworker. Um, I was then promoted to supervising caseworkers. Um, and then they also made me the champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I was also responsible for doing hearings. I'm the hearings coordinator. So if anyone did not like the benefit determinations, I was the person that represented the county um, in that judicial hearing. Then Benton Harbor's water crisis came, and so uh, the state of Michigan decided that they wanted to put the program locally with our county office. My director, um, being that it was such a large project, she wanted to ensure that the person she appointed to that role was someone that already had community relationships. And so I was appointed to project coordinator, and at that particular time doing all of the state roles that I mentioned and project coordinator. How I did it, I do not know. Um, and so I managed that project. I was responsible for water distribution services and ensuring that individuals had resources for lead, um, information and things of that nature. I stayed with them for a total of nine years and then I transitioned to the Benton Harbor Housing Commission as the assistant deputy director. So that's my professional career. As it relates to the Board of Education, I decided to join and came um, to the board and was appointed as the trustee in February of 2020. I was also promoted to secretary in that same meeting, so it was more than likely the quickest promotion in the Board of Education history. I was secretary five minutes after being on the board. I then realized within three or four months of being on the board that four people were not returning, and so they began prepping me to be the president. Extremely overwhelming, but I had to challenge myself and ask myself, if not you, then who? And so we have four new members that came in. And as of that January, they unanimously elected me as their president. And I've been the president of the Board of Education since January of 2021. Um, and this is my, I've communicated it's my final year, but I'm getting pushed back on that. So we will see uh, what God has in store, whether I will be able to take my rest and serve as a trustee or if I'll be the president for another year. Thank you. Do you see what I'm talking about in terms of how busy these women are with multiple jobs that they're doing? It is quite impressive. And so I'm ready to lean in to this conversation with these women and we will invite you to ask questions at the end. So save your questions and you are part of this conversation as well. All right. So. I'm hearing all these different roles that you have and the accomplishments. And I'm curious, when you were growing up, those early years, did you have any sense that you would be leading out in the positions that you're leading out today? I see, Judge, you are <laughs> you're looking to the stars, but you're also, this is something that resonates with you. Um, okay, so where I am today, absolutely not. Um, when I arrived here 44 years ago, absolutely not. Um, I can look around this room and I know a lot of people. So you understand when I say in 1980, um, shortly, yes, yeah, some of you who were not born, that's okay. I'm going to deal with that. Uh, but... <laughs> In 1980, um, and if you've been here for a while, there, there, the country was going through a lot of different changes, and the uh, Twin Cities, unfortunately, uh, sometimes stated as the longest bridge between the two. So we're nodding. This is a real conversation, okay? Um, for those who don't know what the Twin Cities... Uh, Benton Harbor and St. Joseph. I serve 
all of Berrien County. And I think that that's important to, to stress and, and because quite candidly, after I got here and kind of got in and as I've been acclimated, uh, Benton Harbor St. Joseph, there's something to be said about that. And uh, they had um, Alex Kotlowitz come over. I was a part of that and you know, the, the, the whole story and the tale of the two cities. Berrien County, Berrien County has a north, did you know that? And a south. And that's been forever. And my daughter, who was Miss Southwest Michigan in 2004, okay, I've been to every little burg, every little parade. I didn't know there was a pickle parade. I didn't understand that. And I can actually drive back roads now, which is a huge thing for me, okay, from the lower part of the county um, all the way back up through um, Sawyer, Marcellus, all of that, okay? That's, and that's all of Berrien County. And each one has a welcome, each one, every little burg. We have more municipalities in Berrien County, individual and believed to be separate Okay, we're not separate. <laughs> we're all people. It's Berrien County, and we all need to be functioning as if we are a single group, to a degree. We are. And I think that's the piece. We're going to get to some of that, the, the diversity and individuality. You don't give that up. That's the whole piece of kind of diversity. We all learn more about each other. We find out that there are some things that are more similar than different. And then we're able to execute what should be planning uh, for our communities, for our school districts, for everyone. Everyone up here is committed. They're committed to the jobs they do, committed to the communities that we serve and for me, for the county. And so I want nothing more than for us to be that strong Berrien County in Southwest Michigan that they talk about, okay? So, so growing up and what you it, no, experienced. There, there were, as I said, I come from the South, okay? Um, my, I did share with others, my parents um, knew Dr. King, and again, that that's, was a, a part of my history. I grew up knowing those kinds of things. Um, other questions, I guess I'm not so a- So that shaped. I, I got shaped, you. okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not a quitter. Um, I come from good stock, from people who didn't quit, uh, who taught other folks to read so they could go and vote. Um, understanding some of the backdrop to things like, um, you know, Rosa Parks. Anybody know that she was not the first one? Okay, and there's a reason. Yeah, there was a reason. And see, th those, are, those are historical things, things we need to really understand. And, you know, first you gotta get your wisdom in and get understanding with it. You need to understand all of the, the facts, not things that someone told you or that you think is accurate. Get facts, okay? So yes, at, at four years old, they started pouring in, and I thought that that was just what I was supposed to do is whatever I could do. I do remember standing in the, li in the kitchen by the stove when my, I have to remember, my mother was 37 when I was born, so I'm talking older parents, and her, my father's older sister, and I said something about going to law school. And she said, Nanny said, they're not gonna let you. And I was like, 13, like, they who? <laughs> you know, I didn't know, I didn't understand that. I have a clear understanding now based on her age and her experience and what that meant. But that was all the more reason to press forward. So at 14, ever since I was 14, I knew I wanted to go to law school. That was it. All of this, that's a God thing. He knew more than I did at 14. Okay, all right. Anyone else on the panel in terms of growing up? I want to take did that. Did you have any idea? All right, Mona. Sure. So growing up, I was uh, in India. Um, girls are, there's more gender specific roles. So girls are normally expected to get married, take care of the house, family. Very rarely are they expected to step into the business world and work. Uh, that's normally, or used to not be the norm. Now it is changing slowly. Um, and my mom, uh, my dad would always, from the very time I remember, he would say, you can do anything. 
just not everything. So pick your anything wisely. So whatever you decide your anything is going to be is what you're going to focus on. And I always knew I wanted to work. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make it better. I didn't know what that meant. And my mom always would say, you are putting in hopes and you know, you are like showing her all these things and she's going to have such a hard time finding a guy who's going to, you know, support all this. <laughs> and you know, I have my husband and my son supporting me, but uh, I was, uh, I always knew I was going to step in when there was a problem and take charge and keep working at it till it was solved. And I had to just remember to find my anything, not chase everything. So. All right. I'll also take that. I grew up in Louisiana. Uh, I was the oldest of a family of seven. My father died when I was 13. And um, there, the teachers were teaching us minority children and, uh, to go to school to become teachers because that's what it was. Well, I always had bigger dreams than being a teacher, but in the uh, area I was in, that's what I was forced into. So I continued to go to school. My mother made the brave change to move to Michigan at the age of 29 with seven kids. I, don't, I have to give her kudos because she saw she wanted better for us. So she contacted her brother who lived here and we came up and lived with him and we, were, we got jobs. And I was talking with the lady one day and she said, you got those kind of skills because I started college and had some background. So she got me in to take the civil service test for the state of Michigan. And that's how my life began. I took the test, I passed, I got hired by the state. I began helping people in some similar position as we were because we were pulling out and getting better and I was able to help some people who were struggling. And I continued that career by moving up and doing things uh, to help others. I decided uh, when uh, my second son was born to step out and do some things and that's when I became the air reduction specialist traveling through the state. I was gone, gone from home a lot, but I certainly enjoyed what I did and I helped a lot of people. Upon that, I, became, I came back to the office and I decided I wanted to do something different more at home to be closer to my children and my husband. So I became a supervisor and I stayed in, I managed people and we took some projects uh, and you might remember this judge, project together where we took people from to zero employment. Well, I led that initiative and we got people hired at least for a while that where they all had jobs and what we call was zero for our county. And we had big celebrations about that. Uh, unfortunately, that is ha not happening now. But it, social work is supposed to be to help people become stronger, better than they were. And we've lost that thought. I think something got lost in the transition, but that's what I see social work still as. And as a supervisor of Bitten Charter Township, when I see people, it's not about giving hands out, it's about helping people become stronger, showing them how to do it, helping them, giving them the tools that they need. Because we don't want dependent people forever. We want to give them the hammer so they can hit the nail, so that they can become self-supporting and that they can feel good about themselves at the end of the day. All right. Any benefits to having women in leadership? So I'll take this one. I think um, absolutely would be the answer. And um, women in leadership is actually responsible for my trajectory in leadership myself. Every promotion that I've received from the first to the most recent was because another woman saw me. Whether she saw a piece of herself in me or saw attributes that, of strength that she wished she had. My first promotion, I was maybe 21 or 22, working in an after school program, and my supervisor saw me and made me lead after school educator. And so just that one person believing in me that I was able to lead a team inspired me to pursue other leadership opportunities. So I would say absolutely because um, representation matters, but it's also important to have people in an area that see, that see you, that visibility. And so if they, if I was not potentially, possibly working for women, I may have been overlooked. So I would say absolutely. Anyone else? I would say obviously, because women can do all the things. <laughs> My goodness. 
all of the things. Um, and that perspective is so important, not just the all the things perspective, but we only know our only are we only know our own experiences. We know our own experiences best. There is power in first person experiences. That's why it's important to have so many voices at the table because everyone's first person experience matters and the backgrounds that we have matter. So we need women at the table. We need a diverse diverse kinds of men at the table. We need diverse kinds of women at the table. We need people who are young and people who are older. We need people who are at different stages because all of these voices help us to understand what each other need and how to move forward better together. Okay, so I'll take advantage of it now. I know how to spell it because I phonetically look. I want you to remember it, write it down, go look it up. S-A-W-U-B-O-N-A. It's Swahili. I think I would say Sayubwana. It means, say it. Who knows it? All right, say it. Who knows it? Then you know what it means. Who knows it? Sayubwana. What does it mean? I see you. I, I see you. I've shared that with everybody in the courthouse knows that word. I see you. That doesn't mean I looked at you. I see you. If we can get there, that's public service, that's, and that's why we've done that. Every judge, I see you. That has nothing to do with how I follow the law and apply. You're gonna do what you took your hand to do, but you need to see all of the people. There are, everybody's there in that courtroom. I have victims, I have defendants, Everybody needs to be seen. I don't think you can make a mistake, honestly. I think you're far better prepared. You talk about what you have in the room. I think you're far better prepared to do your job wherever you are. Whatever management role, however you're developing a school district, however you're out in the community working with people, however you're running a city, they're people. And if each of us can Get that. I mean, go home and look it up. It's a great, you say it in the, in, in, on the way coming in, you greet people. Hey, so I, I won't say I have to look at it to pronounce it right, but yeah. And you say it going away. And that's a big thing. You talk about change. Everybody's talking about change and like what it used to be. What's good? What's getting better? Want to be seen. Is there anybody in here who doesn't want to be seen? No. So I'm curious because especially as it relates to the political life, mayor, you know, we don't see a lot of women. And I'm curious to know, have you experienced any benefits from stepping up into those leadership roles as a woman? Absolutely. Um, and not only as mayor, but in various leadership roles that I've held through nonprofit agencies, or I even worked in a all-male maximum security prison system in Illinois, three different ones, so that was a unique experience in itself. But the character that these leadership roles build in you, um, you learn how to hold yourself different. You learn how to communicate effectively. You learn why it's different to be a female in these leadership roles. You learned that when people don't look you in the eye, you have to speak a different way. You got to communicate with them differently because it happens a lot. People in a room will look at all the men except for me and so I just figure out how do I need to communicate with this person so that they're going to listen to what I have to say. And if it means I say it three, four times and then I email you again, I'm going to get my point across. Um, it's just different tactics that we have to take and it takes extra mental energy to get our messages across. So I say don't give up. Uh, keep going. We need more women in these roles because we have a special lens and we bring a uniqueness to these roles. And we have to realize, too, that everyone don't hear or see us the same. So we have to learn to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And we have to learn, too, to return phone calls to people because people call, go to voicemail, and some people never return phone calls. And when I call people, you're calling back. I never expected to get a call. Well, you call me. I, I want you to know that I hear, I see, and when you have pain, I can feel some pain because I understand what you're going through. And if there's things that I can do to help alleviate that, I will. Imposter syndrome, and we know what that is. 
I see a lot of heads shaking. Talk about that and how you navigate that imposter syndrome. Oh, I'm going to start this one off. And <laughs> it is, um, and uh, when Nick asked me um, to be on this panel, at first I was like, oh, wow, he asked me. That's great. And I signed up. You know, I, I don't remember if I texted him or emailed him and I signed up. And then five seconds later, immediately panic. Like, oh my gosh, what if I'm not good enough? Like, you know, all the other people on the panel are like amazing and, you know, elected officials, mayor, you know, a judge. And I'm just like a, I work for the power company. I work for the community. I'm in external affairs. Like, it's not a big deal, you know, like, and then um, I was uh, talking to my dad, <laughs> ta telling him about this uh, event. And he said, you didn't have this problem when you were little. You never <laughs> had any self-doubt. What is happening here? Um, and we didn't talk much about it. He said, like, just, just do it. You, you got this, you know? And then I started thinking about it. Um, he's an engineer. And from uh, the very beginning, he's taught me to question everything. He's like, when you uh, are question, when you're thinking about it so hard and you know, you're not sure, go back and question. Try and find out why. Go to the bottom of it. And so I started uh, thinking, like, why am I feeling this way? What is imposter syndrome? And how many of you have realized that your phones are not just smartphones, they're like stalker phones? <laughs> <laughs> so before I even Google, like, you know, like the history on imposter syndrome, I start seeing like articles, YouTube clips, <laughs> and I have to share, I'm, I'm gonna be really try and be brief. Um, so I come across this thing on the bicycle, uh, bicycle face syndrome. Or, uh, has anyone heard about it? Okay, so in the, uh, be really quick. In the 1800s, when bicycle was first, you know, made available to everyone, uh, and women started riding them, it, uh, uh, people, got, men started saying, oh, women are going to suffer from this bicycle face syndrome. Uh, and the symptoms literally were bulging eyes, clenched jaw, and flushed cheeks. It's, no, I'm not kidding you, look it up when you go home. And only women would be impacted by this, by the way, it's not guys. And uh, the root of this bicycle face was uh, men did not want women to have the freedom of, not, of you know, just traveling on their own and not being dependent on them to take them. So uh, think about someone riding a bike up the hill, right? Like, yes, you would have flushed cheeks. Yes, you would have clenched jaw, but that's not a bicycle face syndrome, it just means you're riding a bike. Like, <laughs> it happens to everyone, okay? <laughs> and uh, imposter syndrome was actually first, uh, uh, it was not even a syndrome, it's not a medical condition. It was supposed to be a phenomenon, and it was written about uh, white women who were in, like, you know, corporate or, like, business world. And um, it first came about when Title IX was passed and women were allowed to go into college and, you know, started entering the work industry. It actually took traction when Roe v. versus Wade was passed and women had more control over their bodies and you know, were more uh, taking control on their lives. And so it was, it was just like bicycle face syndrome was a strategy that some people came up with to prevent women from having freedom to travel. Imposter syndrome was another strategy that, came, that people came up with to prevent, to, to create this doubt in women, you know, that they aren't good enough. So we also have some, so yes, get a mentor, you know, do the power pose, have affirmations, all those things help. Th those are all good things. But remember, like, don't take the bait. <laughs> don't fall for it. Know your strengths, believe in yourself, and have people, you know, who are your, who will tell you like it is. If you're not doing good, they'll be like, hey, no, that was not okay, that's not cool have those people in your life so they, that you, know, you can run things past them, that you can reflect with them. But don't allow these negative thoughts to constantly run in your mind because then they will become your reality. Speak positive to yourself. And my litmus test is actually my son. I, I always say, would I say this to my son if he was going through this? If not, then I shouldn't say this to myself. I should not speak these, these doubts about my, cast these doubts about myself. I should use kind words to myself too. So 
please don't take that bait. It is natural to have doubts. It is natural for us to have, for any human to have anxiety when you are challenged with something new. And that is good because that means you're going to be on your toes and you're gonna do well. So that, that, that's what I have to say on imposters. All right, I see a couple people wanna jump in. Okay, so I'll try to be really brief. Um, so if any of you have been around me in a situation where I'm able to just sit, you'll notice most of the time I sit to myself and I appear really quiet. I'm a natural introvert. So I have been running from the spotlight, whether it was church or at school, all of my life. I still to this day ask my closest friends and family, who do these people think I am? <laughs> Anytime I get an invitation to do something or I get an award, and so I have finally had to accept you exactly who God has designed you to be, and that's who they see. Um, so sometimes even before this panel, I, I had to get myself together because the, the child in me is afraid or wants to be to herself, but the leader in me has to challenge her and tell her God has a calling on your life, pick up the phone. And so that's what I, I just motivate myself and remind myself that you are exactly who God designed you to be. Um, and so I attempt to prevent myself from having moments of self-doubt, but it's natural. My grandmother says that when you get to the point where you are not uh, slightly nervous or intimidated, then you've lost a bit of your humility um, and so I take it naturally and I just step up to the plate and answer God's call. Okay, so authenticity, remember that. Authenticity, be you. <laughs> be the best you can be you, but be you. Trying to fit, it's like a coat that just, you know, it doesn't work. You never get comfortable when you're trying to meet someone else's expectations, walk the way somebody wants you to walk, all of it, it's not comfortable. And you're generally at your best comfortable, okay? Authenticity. Now, with that, I think I'm one of the funniest persons in the world. Now, some of you may not agree, okay, but I think I'm a real hoot, all right? Um, but I like humor, and I think humor helps people get comfortable. So I shared this upstairs, and here's the story. As I said, it was a God thing. I was in a space, I still don't know, in 19, this was, bef I mean, was this like right 1992? I get a call. I could not at that time pronounce legitimately the name of the uh, state bar president. It's Kusagian, okay? And I get a call and an invitation to, um, join a state bar committee, and it's the Judicial Qualifications Committee. I also, at that time, did not recognize that that was the most sought after, I guess, almost prestigious position that anyone could have in terms of state bar committee work. Um, I did think that it made sense that we were down here in Little Berrien County, not big east, west, all those other folks, and um, I drove farther than anyone else to get to Lansing for those meetings other than the person from the UP who actually took a plane to come in, okay? Um, so some of those, the dynamics, I won't go deep into that, but um, huge room. And, and the whole point of that is you want to be a judge. So you come before this committee group um, for um, your qualifications. There's a, a huge process for that, and then there's this huge interview. And so around the table, there had to be Mm, eight, eight, six, not less than 16 of us. Um, think of an interview, you walk in and it's just flanked, you know, somewhere 15, 16 or better people. Um, and it was an all day back then, we did a lot, of, a lot of work. It was an all day kind of process and they had lunch. And we took a lunch break and um, it was just me. And um, I wasn't, of course, I'm, again, I, um, Dykema and all the, the names, I didn't know these were not, I didn't know these, I worked at legal services, okay? And um, so they go out, that, that, you could still smoke at that time, so, but you had to go out for folks to smoke, you know? And so um, they went outside, and the, the State Bar Building still is, it's an absolutely fabulous uh, building, the edifice, it's a lot of marble, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and so they were outside, and I walked out, and you kind of look around, and you, as you say, you figure out now, where do I go? I, I don't want to just stand here, so I need to go stand somewhere. 
And so I went to a group of gentlemen, three gentlemen were standing there, and I went and I stood. Um, I won't describe what they were wearing here. It's live stream. But it was very, uh, how would I say that, um, um, stereotypical, okay, attire. Bow ties, let's go with that. Bow ties and the whole stuff. And, and they're smoking the pipes. And I stood there. And they were talking. And the one guy finally looked over and said, did you need something? I said, no. And they continued their conversation, and I continued to stand there. And um, I forget the second. There was a second line. I've, over the years, of course, of time, I've forgotten that one. The third line, and we just, you know, no, I'm just standing here. And the third one said, did they send you out here to get us? And I said, no. <laughs> I was just looking at the beautiful trees, and it was a fall day, at the beautiful trees and the glistening, we had had a little ice, and the sun hitting that and the, color, and the flowers and the, 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 the fall foliage and things, and this beautiful building. And it was such a uh, picturesque you know, representation. I just thought I would add a little color to it. <laughs> and, and there were three sets of eyes that went. <laughs> it took a minute. And then there was a smile on one. And he and I were the best buddies from that point forward. Um, he was comfortable. I was comfortable. He got it. People talk about safe spaces, you know, um, and, and that makes a difference. But I do. I think humor, and if you don't take yourself too seriously, um, you can smile about a lot of different things. You don't get that burden down. Don't ever. Life on this side of the ground, okay, life is too good to let anybody get you burdened down with all that other stuff. So let them have their issues, whoever they are, whatever they are. And if you've got humor, you figure out what yours is. Mine is, I think I'm a hoot, and so I work with that. Uh, but whatever it is, um, it makes a difference. As I said, it, made, it set the tone for moving forward and for me in serving in that capacity. Um, that's, what did I say that was, 90, early 90s? And I was on that committee until I could no longer be on that committee because I too had to go before that committee mm -hmm. to um, be appointed as, as, a, as a judge. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was great to know some of the people that I was sitting in front of without that extra tension mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So safe to say you did not suffer from <laughs> imposter syndrome. So, you know, I have, I have more questions, but I really do want to engage our audience because they may have questions as well, especially after hearing some of these stories. So I don't know, Mr. Gunn, if we have a roving microphone, if there are questions, I see a couple of hands already. We can borrow one of our microphones. Test. Okay, there we go. Um, my name is Kim Jorgensen Gain. I live in St. Joe. I know lots of you and lots of you. And <laughs> um, I am a writer and I ran for state senate in 2022. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am writing a book called Mother Activist Raising Ourselves and the Men We Fall For A Love Story. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. It's about the prices we pay when we quote unquote get political and what it costs us when we don't. Thank you for mentioning Roe, that is certainly <laughs> a big one. Um, so I would love to know from the panel, because many of you are involved politically, if not officially politically, there is corporate politics and <laughs> you know all of those things. So I would love to know from each of you or any of you who care to answer what that brings up for you in your experiences. Thank you. Within uh, my township, there's always politics. 
because there's someone else who doesn't wear the head of supervisor that think they should be. And I'm determined to do my job every day. So there is, there is conflict, but I pray before I go. I have to pray every day. I talk to Jesus about it. I meditate. And when I speak to that person, I'm always kind. I'm, I'm not rude, but I'm very much to the point. They know I mean business. And I think it's really important to have women in the political realm. I think I remember hearing a statistic that's 80-20, 80% male, 20% female. And if you only have 20% females helping make policies and decisions, it's really skewed. We need to have at least 50-50 to make it even so we have viewpoints of everybody. Um, even down to local politics, you might not think that these things creep into local politics, but it really does. Um, even if it means you get on your library board, your school board, um, your local commissions, it's, it's important to have a female voice because we have a unique perspective and if we don't have that perspective, we're gonna miss out on so much. Um, so I encourage anyone in here who is interested, it's not that daunting, it's actually quite easy. There's a lot of mentors in here, so if anyone is interested in getting into that political realm, reach out. I'm always happy to talk with anybody. I'll talk about corporate politics. So corporate politics is real, it is, in every organization you go. And I will say, don't spend uh, time trying to, you know, spin wheels trying to master it and play in it and don't take the bait. Focus on being really good at what you do. And there's a balance between what you, uh, being really good at what you do and being uh, socially, uh, accept I wouldn't say acceptable, but like charming. So. You don't need to pe people please necessarily, but you do need to be you do need to be able to blend in a little bit. So, don't go out of your way. You don't need to change who you are as a person. Just find that mix, that balance there, and you'll be okay. Don't focus on trying to play that game because you're going to completely uh, be a pawn, and it'll steal the joy. If you focus on what you need to be doing, which is what you've been hired to do, and if you enjoy doing that, that is actually gonna be plenty for you to excel. I think we have someone else, the mic. Mm -hmm. Hello, hi, I'm Kibra Van Horn Williams. Um, I'm the DJ's wife. <laughs> no, but I'm a, a certified personal trainer, and I'm also a community advocate in Ben Harbor. Um, I just want to ask you guys, um, first of all, I always do a women's empowerment event during the summertime, which I'm inviting you all to, to come to. Um, and I will be reaching out to each and every last one of you guys, because I think it's very important to come together as women and um, do something that, where people can touch you, talk to you, and interact with you. What do you guys do for your spare time? What do you do for fun? I would like to ask each woman, what do you do for fun? And that was my question in terms of how you balance that fun with your professional lives. I don't have any spare time, okay? Um, That's real. I think you should live life to the fullest. Um, no, and, and people find out, you know, if you need more sleep, then please get more sleep because it's, it's, it's uh, necessary for your body. That's the period of time within which we're um, down and, and it is doing what it will do on its own if we allow it to do that, okay? So that's important. If you find, like me, that you really don't need that much sleep to function, then that's okay too. You know, um, getting into bed at, you know, to get the eight hours and you're still sitting there batting your eyes, well, that's a waste of energy and exercise for everyone. So find your balance. It's important for you to know that. Um, along, I, we talked about so many hats. So I'm also the election judge. And so I worked that um, Tuesday and um, left uh, early for me at 5 o'clock. Last that's, Tuesday, that's the primary. Past, that's the primary. <laughs> Not Super Tuesday. Ours was the Tuesday before. Um, and left early. Um, at five o'clock to get home so that I could grab my husband. He had something we wanted to eat. And I needed to be down in Niles in South County um, by eight o'clock when the polls closed. We did not finish in Niles until 3 a.m. 
It was a long night. All of you remember that tornado thing that was happening at us? Oh, I was so glad that we were stuck there because I wasn't out in that. That was wonderful. <laughs> but we didn't finish until 3 that morning. And so I drove back home. Uh, we drove back home, jumped in the bed. I got three hours of sleep, and I was at work the next morning. Um, I chose to do that. There were some of my colleagues across the state responsible for same things, and they didn't do that. Men, mostly. But um, <laughs> I chose to do that. And... Um, and I could function, and I could tell, though, at the, at the end of the day, it was time. It was time for me to go home and get some rest. So don't worry about, you know, just what, what somebody else says. Figure out what works for you. I get up in the morning. I have my prayer time. I figured out how to talk to Jesus while pedaling. I'm on the bike. We do that first thing in the morning. Um, uh, I have an evening uh, thing. I'm sitting on this little cushion now because, yes, I used to wear... Who was that? Those sharp high heels. Oh my gosh, I did. <laughs> there was a time, but that time, that season has passed. And I also did a lot of dance in college, you know, Jahari group, all of that. You pay for it. People tell you that you didn't believe them, <laughs> but you do. And that's okay. Uh, so there are things I have to do now as I'm aging to take care of me. Um, my husband and I have date nights. Uh, we like to, we, we take care of each other. Uh, we go to the theater. I love live anything almost. You know, live theater, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with that. Um, I'm very uh, involved with my church, and uh, that's, um, that's my spiritual anchor there. And for weekend and midnight, usually Wednesday, everybody knows I'm leaving on my way going to church because it's Wednesday, and hump day means a refill because you all have already worn part of that down <laughs> from Monday through Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we're ready to get through um, the end of the week, and so I have a chiropractor. Um, I have learned to regularly um, vacation. I had to learn that. I had to learn that. So all you young, please do that early. That's important. Yes, Judge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yes, Your Honor. I mean, see, no, do do that because um, we are we are the people. We we are fixers. That's something else we have to acknowledge. That you know, women, I mean, you do. You go in and you fix it. You do it. You just get it done, and you don't realize that that is having its impact on just you physically too. So please learn to vacation regularly for you. And I have two wonderful grandsons now. You may not yet, but for those who are to come, because you want to be healthy, you're more effective healthy. All right, a couple more. All right. well, I usually start my day off with meditation, and uh, I get up and I spend some time with my husband first thing in the morning, and then I talk to my grandson, because he's up early, he's a baseball player, so he's up early practicing. So he's telling me about his day and how it's going, and he's already planning my life for the summer and where we're going. And then I used to go to work, and then I come home. I take some downtime for myself, and I do things that is fun for me. And it may not be the same thing every day. And it may be uh, calling someone who's ill or spending time with them by phone, or it could be someone away out of town someplace. But I find myself connecting with people because that's important. And I, uh, I see my sorority sisters here. I want to give a shout out to my AKA, of course. Love you guys. Thank you for coming. But you're a big part of my life also. And we realize with each life it's important and you have to take the time to smell the flowers. Because if we don't smell the flowers now, it's too late later. All right, one more here and then we take another question, Mariah. I am just learning how to let other people help me. Um, I have a colleague who I admire and respect. He is wonderful. He's a tremendous advocate for women, um, but also is retired. And when he talks about his life, I discover that his wife, if there was anything, he's like, oh, no, my wife takes care of it, everything at home. If he needs oil changed in his car, his wife takes care of it. And I also know that he had a secretary at work for many years who was beside him. This incredibly successful man is incredibly successful because his home life and his work life is supported by two entire women. And I'm thinking, as women, we often think, we'll cut the sleep, we'll cut the time, we will do all the things. We all need help. 
We all need help. We cannot do all these things by ourselves. Um, it's all right to go out to eat. It's all right to let someone help you clean the house. It's all right to let someone help you take care of the children. It's all right to learn how to have a secretary. I'm having to learn. I didn't have, I was a nurse. I was the person who was doing all the things. Now I have student workers. It's, I have to take time to train them to let them help me. And if we're going to think about the kinds of success that the men who came before us have had, we also have to think about how to let ourselves learn to have to support yes. and to let ourselves learn to do that. All right, we have one more question and then we will wrap it up. All right. Hello, um, I'm Maria Truman and I'm currently a student here at Andrews University and I'd really love it if you could just go down the line and if you could time travel back to your teenage self and you only had 30 seconds to give your teenage self a bit of advice, what would you say to yourself in those 30 seconds? That was one of our questions as well. Good question, Mariah. <laughs> so I'll go first if it's okay. My, it would be quick and easy. Be comfortable in your greatness. Um, and I don't mean comfortable, meaning you are uh, too comfortable to move, but comfortable meaning moving without fear. Um, and that was something that I didn't inherit until 2020. Um, so that would be my advice to myself. Be comfortable in your greatness. I think there's so much I would tell myself. I can't pick one thing. There's, as a young teenager, there's so much you don't know. Um, but I think just be confident in yourself and trust your instincts and do great things in life because I think you're so used to thinking, well, I can't do it, imposter syndrome. Um, but you actually can, and it's not too hard. Just give it a try. There's a, there, there's a lot, uh, but I think being courageous and practicing more compassion, those are the two things. Treat others as you want to be treated. You know your heart. Whatever you're sitting there feeling, sensing, thinking now, you know your heart. At 14, I knew my heart. I wanted to be a lawyer. I've always wanted that, and when people said I couldn't, I didn't embrace that. Law school was a get through bar exams, you know, getting jobs, all of that. Um, it's been a journey. There's a lot in different roles. I can't go into all of that. But um, be authentic. Be yourself. Be true to yourself. Believe in yourself. If you don't believe in you, you will never convince anybody else to have any belief in you. So believe in yourself. Um, mine, as I said, is a faith thing. So it's all about where God is directing. And as doors open, yep. That was for you to walk through. 2020, that was rough. That was rough. And the courthouse in Berrien County closed for one week, and that is because we were mandated to. There were places all around this state who had backlogs. We did not. We worked hard. There were things I found in me that I still, at that point, did not know existed to come up to leadership. Don't be afraid of who you are and how you have been designed. There's more to you than you will ever truly imagine. I think most of us leave here not having fully maxed out. I'm working on that. All right, Pro Professor. I think I would tell myself, you're gonna be okay. And you're not alone. You're not gonna ever be alone. Even when you feel like you're by yourself, like there's a God in heaven who loves you, who knows you, you are never gonna be alone and you're gonna be okay. You're going to be okay. We're stronger than we are. Thank you so much, ladies. <laughs> Wonderful panel. Thank you so much.
Hello? Ah, okay. All right. What an incredible panel. Let's hear it for these ladies. I mean, empowering, inspiring, but it's not over yet. So we're going to transition now to our keynote speaker here. Uh, I am humbled and honored to introduce uh, Ms. Dr. Kimberly Pichot. Uh, Dr. Pichot, she's a dedicated educator and consultant. Let me put this down here. With a profound commitment to empowering women in academia and the business world. Throughout her career, she has championed gender equality and provided mentorship to aspiring female leaders. With a keen focus on fostering academic excellence and practical business competencies, Dr. Pichot engages her students through innovative learning and activities designed to inspire confidence and growth. Her passion for facilitating learning and professional development extends beyond the classroom as she leads students in impactful community service initiatives. Before joining Andrews University, Dr. Pichot made significant contributions to institutions such as Washington Adventist University, the Institute of Business and Medical Careers, and her own consulting business, Complete Success, Inc. Her dedication to empowering women is evident in her leadership roles and mentorship programs aimed at nurturing over 200 female-owned startups. During her seven-year tenure in Guinea, West Africa, Dr. Pichot actively promoted women's empowerment initiatives while working with illiterate women to start successful micro-businesses. Her global perspective and multicultural experiences have further fueled her commitment to equality and diversity in all facets of her work. Over the past three decades, Dr. Pichot has empowered countless women to exceed their expectations in their professional endeavors through specialized training and consulting services. Her expertise is organizational development, team building, and strategic visioning that has enabled women-led organizations to thrive and succeed. Fluent in Portuguese, French, and English, Dr. Pichot navigates diverse cultural landscapes with ease, fostering inclusivity and empowerment wherever she goes. As a keynote speaker, she continues to champion the cause of women's entrepreneurship, embodying a vision of empowerment and success for women in business everywhere. Everyone, let's please welcome Dr. Pichot. She walked to the front of the classroom. Her head was down. Her hair covered her face, and that's pretty much how she had been the entire semester. When she got to the front, she froze. And in those moments where I waited for her to start speaking, a myriad questions went through my mind. Had I supported her enough? Had I helped her to grow? Could I have done something different to break her out of her shell? None of us really knew her. She had stayed in her corner and didn't participate. And then she lifted her head, moved her hair out of her face, and said, I'm passionate about life. And as she extended her hands, we saw terrible scars on those wrists. She was 21 years old. She told us how she had been raised right. And yet in high school, she'd gotten in with the crowd and then a controlling boyfriend. And before you knew it, she was pregnant, kicked out of her home, and desperate. So she married the boyfriend, and the abuse began. He was brutal. Over time, they had two little girls. I could tell stories about her pregnancy and being kicked around. He was cheating on her and constantly beating her up every time he got drunk. The two little girls were her life. One day, Dan, her husband, told her that she was good for nothing and she might as well kill herself. So she went to the bathroom and slit her wrists. When he saw the blood in her life leaving her, he panicked and called 911. She spent the next four months in a center, retraining, relearning, regaining confidence. But when she got out, 
She wanted to be with her little girls, so she went back to Dan. And the abuse continued. Shortly after that, Dan was drunk again, and he beat her. And in anger, he was leaving the house, and she said, I don't know why I love you, but I love you. 20 minutes later, Dan ran a four-way stop, and he killed an entire family. He himself was brain dead, being kept alive on machines. And the time came a week later as his body was decaying that she and his dad made the decision to pull the plug. And as they were holding his hands, dad holding one hand and she holding the other hand, and the doctor unplugged all the equipment, Dan pulled his hand out of his father's a man who had abused him physically and sexually. And he squeezed Holly's hand. And she said, at that very moment, her cell phone rang. There was no cell phone number on there. But the message said, I'm sorry I hurt you. I love you too. She told the class that she knew that that wasn't Dan because Dan was dead. But she said, I know it was God giving me that message so that I knew I could move on. In the next few minutes, and I will make it brief, we'll journey through a couple other stories that exemplify unbreakable resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back, basically from anything. Holly, despite put-downs, abuse, verbal and physical, she rose. She emerged as a strong, courageous woman who demonstrated resilience as she continued her education, graduated, and got a job as in billing and coding at the hospital. Michelle was 27. She had a rough exterior and a foul mouth, and we broke fights up in the classroom, and it was just a disaster to have her in my classroom. And one night, she was helping me lock the building. I was the last professor in the, in the building. And I joked with her that if I saw her alone in the parking lot, I would be afraid of her. And she said, one day I'll tell you my story, Kim. She went through so many foster homes that she said, I can't remember most of them. My caseworker said I went through 11 homes. I remember one woman, one name. She was someone who cared deeply about me but I had to move on to another home. So at 17, I emancipated myself, got my own apartment, got a little job, and got pregnant. And the next 10 years were very difficult. She struggled financially, and she struggled to find herself. She decided then at 27 to come back to school and make a difference in her children's lives. She said, I want to give them an example of success, and I want to open my home to foster children and give them long-term support. I also want to influence other families to do the same. Michelle's journey was a journey to overcome trauma, to open her heart, to forgive people, and to forge ahead. Sam was a mother of seven children, a blended family, with his, hers, and their children. Their children ranged from 2 to 21 when I met her in my classroom. They were struggling financially. She didn't have an education and had spent years working part-time in fast food. 
One day she caught her 11-year-old son sneaking a cigarette out of her purse and found out that he'd been smoking for years. And she was horrified, and she decided, we are going to change, we're going to change as a whole family. And she said, if you're going to live in my house, we are stopping to smoke now. She went and got a a used basketball hoop, put it in her yard, and the deal was, if you have an urge to smoke, you must get someone else in this house, there's lots of us, go out and shoot some, some hoops. She saved money from not smoking and bought a membership for the family. Family was too big, they had to buy two family packs at the Y. And they started on this journey of health. And I watched her grow, I watched her family change, and I watched her graduate and get hired at the county office. Her journey of financial struggles demonstrated her resourcefulness, perseverance, and resilience. No matter what your story is, you are unbreakable. You are resilient. Your story may may be different from these ladies, or you may have resonated with something. Take a look at yourself. Take a look at those around you. You are unbreakable. A diamond... Go ahead. There's a diamond quote there. A diamond is a chunk of coal that did well under pressure. You're a diamond, each and every one of you. (laughs) Go to the next one. There are many ways that you can cultivate resilience. Here are six ways. I describe them in the the next slides, but we're going to skip the next slides and just go through these. Cultivate a, a growth mindset. You can always learn, you can always grow, you can always move. Practice self-care. Take care of yourself. You've heard examples of this all evening long. Build a support network. Ladies and gentlemen, if someone is putting you down, don't hang out with them. Figure out how to stay away from them. Surround yourself with people who care. Surround yourself with people who will lift you up. And it will help build that confidence in you. Set realistic goals. Baby steps. If you set a goal that is too big and too unattainable, you will feel discouraged. Break it down and just take one step, one step, one step. Develop problem-solving skills. Practice. Think about alternatives. Think about how you can change things around you. And then embrace challenges. They will help you grow. Any challenge you face, what can you learn from it? Take those lessons and move on. You can go all the way to the last slide. As it once was beautifully said, the woman I was yesterday introduced me to the woman I am today, which makes me very excited about meeting the woman I will become tomorrow. As we leave here this evening, carry these stories with you of resilience. Carry it in your heart. Give yourself grace and share your story Every one of you has a story of resilience, and it can inspire a friend. It can inspire a mentee. It can inspire a total stranger. Whether you identify with Holly, with Michelle, with Sam, or your story is completely, completely different, you ladies are unbreakable. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Pichot. Inspiring. Absolutely inspiring. So I believe uh, we do have some amazing awards to potentially share. Uh, so uh, Nick has uh, shared that there are some certificates of appreciation for leaders in our community who are pillars of our community. And we'd like to take a moment just to recognize uh, a few. Uh, one is someone who couldn't be here, Sue Holland, uh, who is a retired firefighter of 20 years for the St. Joseph uh, Charter Township. So if we could just give her a round of applause, relay her accolades as well. And then uh, one, uh, well, two more, two more. So. First up, who is here is, I believe, uh, Trish Robinson, Patri Patricia Robinson, who is a trailblazing educator and leader who has made significant contributions to the field of education. Oh, yes, as superintendent of Buchanan Community Schools for the past four years. Trish has not only demonstrated her commitment to academic excellence, but has also etched her name in history as the first African American to hold this position in the district. With a, yes, yes. Uh, with a career spanning 27 years in education, Trish's passion lies in fostering the development of early learners armed with a master's degree in educational technology and a second master's in school administration with a specialized focus on early childhood. She brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to her role. Originally hailing from Benton Harbor, Michigan, Trish remains deeply connected to her roots, married to her high school sweetheart of 25 years. She is the proud mother of four children and a delighted grandmother as well. Trish's personal and professional journey, journey reflects a commitment to education, equity, and the betterment of the educational experience for students and education alike. Congratulations. <laughs> And then uh, one more certificate is for Sisters from Another Mother, SFAM. Are they here? Okay, come on up. Sisters from Another Mother, SFAM is a nonprofit organization based in Benton Harbor, dedicated to serving, empowering, and engaging with our community. Founded in December 2018 by D Diane Young, a Benton Harbor native and passionate community advocate. SFAM has since evolved into a thriving organization with strong commitment to volunteerism, unity building, and love-driven initiatives. As FFAM, our mission is, their mission is clear to work collaboratively with individuals and organizations who share their passion for community service and empowerment. They firmly believe in the power of volunteering, unity, and love to create positive change in our neighborhoods. Their purpose is multifaceted. They aim to remove barriers by providing resources and financial support to those in need, empowering individuals through mentorship and educational programs, fostering unity to create a better community for all. Everyone, uh, please congratulate SFAM. All right, I am going to hand the microphone back to Nick. All right, thank you guys for those that are still left with us. Uh, thank you guys for, uh, you know, sticking through with us and allowing us to put this event on. Uh, we also have uh, students that we still uh, have to nominate, uh, we, that were nominated for awards. And uh, can we, <laughs> well, they, the rest of them, we have, we have two of them, yeah. Yeah, you are the two that's left still, so. <laughs> <laughs> the other ones have to go. <laughs> but yeah, so you, you guys want to introduce yourself and to say a few few words about, about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Priska L. I am a student for mm -hmm. Community International Development. I'm so happy to, for this day. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, so my name is Jaden Paling. I'm a member of a bunch of non-for-profits as well as working in an accounting firm. Um, I think I'm going to use this certificate to help me be more involved in the community, so thank you very much.
All right. Yeah. <laughs> we also had another student, Ayana LeBlanc, who uh, couldn't make it here today. Uh, but thank you guys. Uh, your class is dismissed. <laughs> we got a test tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, no we're all good. Everybody get to. Hey, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye.